I have six pages of questions, so let's try to get through as much as we can quickly, if that's okay. possible. I'll do it. Uh, I'll do it. Uh, so if you could get the financing for any project, now, this is an interesting question for you because I would imagine most people want to get in business with you right now, but yeah. if you could get the financing for anything, what would you make and why? I, it, dude, this is going to sound so terrible, but I think I could make anything I wanted to right now. And I, I'm making the movies that I want to make. I wanted to finish the story of Guardians of the Galaxy, which I'm doing. Uh, I want to do the holiday special, which I'm doing. They asked me what I wanted to make a TV show of. It's Peacemaker. And I always wanted to do the Suicide Squad. I was very uh, jealous when uh, David got to do his movie. So those are the things I wanted to do. There's, there's nothing. There's other things I think about all the time. A Western I would love to do. Sometimes I think about doing a musical. But I've done the things that I want to do and, you know, I'm really happy with my choices. You know, I loved this movie and I loved the freedom that you had working in the R rating. It was like a peek into your brain. Um, and I, I would imagine that it's going to be tough. I know you're going to do PG-13 for Guardians, but if you made another comic book or superhero movie in the future, do you see yourself going back to PG-13 or do you think R rating is pretty much your horizon? No, I totally think I could do whatever I think the story, you know, requires. Like, I would never do an R-rated Guardians of the Galaxy. It just wouldn't be what that show is. It's a fan. It's 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 for families and old people love it. And it just really is. It's more like a fairy tale. And I think it is completely that is what it is. You know, Suicide Squad is something very different than that, you know, and the stakes are different. And, the, you know, all of that is different. But if I were to do, say, a Shazam movie, you know, which I'm not saying I'm going to do Shazam movie. Um, I don't think that should be, you know, R-rated either. I think that would be, if I did that, it would be PG-13. If I did Deadpool, it would be rated R. So, I mean, it just kind of depends on the project. I think everything is different. And the audience you're speaking to is different. And I love PG-13 movies and I love R-rated movies. I don't have any problem with either of them. Got it. So essentially, if you ever got the keys to like a Superman, it would be PG-13. Yeah, probably. Yes. Yeah. Um, jumping into Suicide Squad, and I want to reiterate again how much I love this movie and how I know fans are going to freak out for it. Your script is so good. Who ruined the most takes from laughing at the dialogue you gave them? Definitely Margot ruined the most takes because her stuff with Flula was he just made her stop. He made her laugh every two seconds and she would not stop. Like Flula made everybody laugh constantly. So uh, that was that was really, you know, that's who it was, Margo. On what day of you, after you turned in the script to Warner Brothers, basically, are you a little surprised that Warner Brothers let you make this movie? Because it's so, uh, it's so not what they've been making. Do you know what I mean? I, I think I have a sort of blindness about that sort of thing. I wrote the script the whole, the whole time thinking they would make, you know, let me make it. I mean... They, you know, they asked, you know, could you make this PG-13? And I said, no. Um, and I said, you know, you can make it and take it with somebody else. and They can direct it. And you can do a PG-13. But if I'm going to direct it, I want it to be R. And they were like, OK, well, that's worth the trade off for us. Um, and so they were they were great about it. What kind of notes does the studio give you um, at this point in your career? And how often do you actually incorporate them? That's a great question. Like they. I give notes, you know, um, I get notes uh, from uh, from Marvel and I get notes from DC, um, but no, they, they are always said, you can take these or, or leave these. You can do whatever you want with these. If you want to take these notes, you can take them. If you don't want to take these notes, you don't have to take them. It's never gotten anything beyond that ever. Um, so, uh, so it's like they give notes, uh, Marvel gives more than DC does uh, to me, but they're the same attitude of like, take what you want and leave the rest. Um, and I, I take a lot of them, you know, I, 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 there's a lot of good ideas in there. And even if I don't take them, like one of the main things I do is I try them, especially while I'm editing, I try them out to see if they work. Like sometimes somebody will say something that I think is like the worst idea. It just seems so distasteful for me. But I go ahead and try it out. And every once in a while I go, oh, I'm really embarrassed because that works incredibly well. Maybe that happens maybe a quarter of the time, but 75% of the time I go, oh, that's as bad as I thought it was. But it's worth it for the quarter of the time that it works out. That's a lot. 
Sure. So that's really my, you know, I'm very open. Like on set, my assistant will say, ah, you know, that seems fake, you know, or something. And I'll, I'll listen to, I'll listen to anybody. Um, I don't, but at the end of the day, it's all me. I mean, nobody, you know, any idea that I take in, it's because I choose to take it, not because I'm being told to, to do something. I'm curious if your version, if your Suicide Squad takes place in um, an alt earth, or is it like what what universe does it share with the current? And I think people want to know with the current DC lineup, does it take place in the Henry Cavill Superman realm? Does it take place in or is it undetermined? Well, I'm, that's outside of my that's that's outside of my realm of knowledge, but it is the DCEU. So it's whatever the DCEU is today and with Aquaman and the Flash and everything else. That's where the Suicide Squad is. So that is that is what it is. Uh, I assume you learn from every project that you make. Um, what did you learn making the Suicide Squad that you want to apply to future stuff? I just am much more confident as a filmmaker than I used to be. And I can relax and I can, you know, everything is, is very planned out for me. So, you know, people know I draw everything in the movie before we shoot. it. So uh, everything is done by the time we get to set. But I was way looser with squad. Like, I found way more shots on set than I'd ever found before. And I found that was a great strength in my filmmaking to not be so locked in. Like on the Guardians movies, they're much more geometric. So it's kind of easier to plan them out. But at the same time, I'll get on set and I'll be like, oh, that shot looks good. But my brain goes, no, but you got to get the day done. You got to get what you plan to get done. And I just go ahead and go with what I had already planned. And I'm much looser and I'm learning to be okay with that of, being looser on set, allowing new ideas to happen, find new stuff and follow my gut instinct on set when things happen. And I think it's the reason why this movie was so much more fun to make for me than other films. You know, I love asking this question. How long was your early earlier cuts of the film versus compared to the finished film? I think the first cut was, it was in the 240 range. Final one is 212. When you say the 240, is that like an assembly or is that a cut that you're like, this is pretty good? I think that was the assembly. I think that was the assembly it was probably 240. And then probably I got it down to about in the high 220s is my cut was probably what it was. And then kind of just kept chipping away from it from there. There was one big major scene section I cut out uh, near the very end of shooting that near the end of editing that I was really afraid to cut um, because there was so much cool stuff in it, but it definitely seemed like the right cut, but people will definitely be able to see it in the future because it's, it's great stuff and it's mostly finished visual effects wise. Well, that's I wanted to know what was the last thing you cut before picture locking? That's what it was. There's a whole section with, uh, with rat catcher and King shark and poke it out man and thinker that I, that I cut that was, pretty dynamite stuff. And the hardest thing was some of Peter Capaldi and David Desmountian's best acting together. But it just was the wrong. We take our time a lot in the movie and I'm proud of that. Um, but it was taking our time at the wrong point in the film. So it was a good cut. It hurts, but that's how, that's how movie making is. I'm assuming this is when they've exited the bar and are together. It's right after they're outside of the bar. Yeah. Right. When the so guys, you, when the guys, when, when, when Rick Flagg and them are in the, uh, the, the, the armored vehicle. Completely. Um, do you see yourself, what for fan, what can fans look forward to on the eventual Blu-ray? I think some really great, uh, you know, scenes that we cut out from the movie, you know, um, there's a really great, uh, uh, scene with that's to Jesse Reyes a solo, which is in the movie. It's now seen in a moment. You see this moment where, King Shark is looking out the window and he sees the young couple kissing. And you realize in that moment, hopefully, just how he's not a part of this world and how he longs to be a part of this world. And that actually was a much longer sort of montage. Um, that is really beautiful and I really like in and of itself. You know, it just was, again, it was at the wrong place in the movie. Did the MPAA ask you to make any edits? No, they didn't. I think, think we got by at an R rating on their first pass through, you know. There was one thing that I cut out uh, earlier uh, with one of the characters' deaths that was really gory. And I, and I was like, you know what? 
It's just a little too much. But again, we might see it someday in some form. One of the things is that you have this ability to write characters that are sometimes terrible people and make the audience root for them. What is that secret that you, the secret sauce that you're able to make people care about these characters? Well, because I don't believe these people are terrible at their core. You know, I think someone like Bloodshot or Harley, you know, I think they have goodness to them. I think in a lot of ways, this movie is a story of Bloodshot coming to terms with his own vulnerability and his own goodness, which he has denied his entire life. So I think it's really, I, I, lo I, I love a bad character who finds redemption. Like that's the thing I dig more than anything else in stories. So that's part of it. But there are other characters in the movie that are pretty freaking bad, you know? I mean, not to mention Amanda Waller's not a great person, you know? Uh, she's not great. Thinker's not great. Suarez isn't great. They're pretty bad people. So I don't find the good in everything. There's, Thinker's very charming. He's funny, but he's certainly not. I don't, I don't see the good in him myself, you know? No, completely. You have two amazing Harley scenes in this movie that fans are going to lose their shit over. Did you feel any extra pressure? Because this is such a beloved character to so many people. What is it like for you writing scenes for Harley? And is there extra pressure knowing that these scenes are going to be not dissected, but kind of dissected because of people's love of this character? No, I felt excited, man. I love the character Harley Quinn. I love Paul Dini's original Harley Quinn. I think she's one of the most well-written comic book characters of all time and consistently well-written, not always, but a lot. And being able to you, you know, speak in her voice and to write for her was a privilege, but I also felt incredibly comfortable doing it. You know, she isn't a James Gunn character because I didn't create her in the same way I created Ratcatcher too, you know, or even King Shark in this, you know, some ways. But uh, she is totally a James Gunn character and that I get her, you know. She isn't so different from Bolty and Super. So it's like, I, I, love, I love her character. I love who she is. And I felt ex extremely comfortable making this the most Harley of all Harleys that have been on the movie screen. There are just such amazing shots of the flowers and the birds. Where did that idea come from to put that in the movie? Well, I think in some ways it's something that, you know, I always, you know, I did a game, a video game called Lollipop Chainsaw. And I always loved the sort of, uh, you know, in that game, which I did with, with, with Suda in Japan, um, uh, I always loved uh, the way that the hearts and hearts and, you know, beautiful little things came out of people mixed with blood. And so a lot of it goes back to that, the aesthetic of mixing this horrible gore with Harley's sort of, you know, starry eyed way of looking at life and creating Harley vision, basically. So uh, that was something that came on very early. It was in the first cut of the, you know, first draft of the script. I think fans are going to lose their shit. Um, yeah. One of the things that I love about your script is that every scene takes a left turn that you're not expecting. And it, it's, yeah. I mean, and it's hard. And, and you know this, man, when I see a lot of movies and like when a movie takes such left turns that you don't see coming, it's so refreshing. Can you talk about yeah. where that, how does that enter the script phase are in terms of, are you writing those kinds of twists like at the beginning when you're writing the scene or is it sort of like, you know, how does that, how do those left turns come into it? Uh, you know, I was just really creatively inspired with this, this movie and I can come up with a bunch of BS about how I came up with that stuff. But the truth is I was just really inspired. And as soon as I started writing the script, it just sort of lent itself to that with all of the twists and turns of being able to surprise people and also surprise me, you know, Harley has a big speech, which I guess you were alluding to earlier. And that big speech, like I wrote before I wrote the screenplay, I wrote it down like on a piece of notepad or something. So it's like those things were just sort of built in and baked in and, you know, good, good, you know, all good plots have plot twists. Sometimes the plot twists are not so noticeable. In this movie, they're really noticeable because they're the opposite of what you expect. But also in some ways, Frosty, there's a lot of big spectacle movies that come out that are, you just know everything that's gonna happen. Dude. So it's kind of yeah. easy to take people on a path other than what they expect when things have gotten a little bit bland, you know? I, dude, you're, you're preaching to the choir. The biggest 
the biggest issue I think with the movie structure that currently exists is that when you are introduced to a character in the first act, it's like, okay, spin the, the wheel. It's one of 10 things that this character is going to be. And yeah. it's just a question of what of is it, what of the 10 is it going to be? Which is why, again, uh, and you know, I don't say this all the time, why I loved your script because it kept right. fucking hitting me over the head in unexpected ways. But moving yeah. on, cause I'm running out of time. Uh, I, I think the VFX on King Shark are just jaw dropping. And th there's a shot in the movie where he's, and you were, you said it earlier, where he's looking outside the van, he sees the couple, you see this reflection on the windshield and you see him behind the windshield, the, the, the window, and you can, it, he looks real. And I sort of, uh, can you sort of talk about getting King Shark right on the screen? Because if those VFX don't work, that character is dead. It was really hard, man. It was really hard. So, you know, you know, I've done furry characters who used to be pretty hard, but are much easier now. And I've done wooden characters, which are pretty easy. Um, but uh, to be able to do the shark skin was really tough. I mean, we went through a lot of versions of trying to get shark skin to look real. And it was hard. And then finally, we get the shark skin looking as good as we can. And we built King Shark. And I always knew he was like this bad bod. We designed him. But then he came out and there was just something about his belly. It was too light, white. It didn't look real. He had too much of packs and that looked too, you know, mammalian, you know. And so it really, so I actually broke him down and said, we have to break him apart and put him back together again because he's not working. And luckily, Framestore, who developed King Shark and then Weta also did a lot of shots with King Shark. They both worked together to create this character that looked as, as real as he does now. But it took a lot of work and it took a lot of moving forward and backtracking one step forward, two steps back over the design. I, I'm a huge fan of Guy Norris and you had him as your second unit director on this. Um, I wanted to know if you could sort of talk about the dynamic of you and Guy, what you asked him to do and how much does it hurt you to let other people photograph your movies? Um, in this case, it was easy because what he photographed was the, uh, the, the truck, the car stuff outside of the cars with the cars flipping around and everything. And we paint, I, first I storyboarded it. So it starts with my storyboards. Then guy takes it into his post viz world and we turn it into post viz. And then we decided exactly what it is. And with car stuff, you can very geometrically figure it out. Guy and I are buddies and I've known him since Scoo. He did Scooby-Doo in 2000. So We've been we, we've known each other a long time. I love his work. I trust him way more than I trust other stunt coordinators. And um, and so it, it was pretty flawless working together. It's t it's hard at times. There's a little bit of stuff different. But, you know, shooting cars really isn't my thing. Like I've never honestly, I've never really done it. Shooting people is different, like shooting action people with action. Like I don't you know, like that's my thing. Like I love doing that. So I love taking guys action sequences that we develop together which he really develops and does great work with but then me being able to shoot it in the way that's the most impactful like that's my thing but shooting cars and stuff it's just it's just not my thing uh, i think a lot of people don't realize the importance of like Obviously, all the light is on you and you deserve it. But I do think that there are so many people that work on movies behind the scenes that don't get enough credit. There's no and, doubt. There's and no so, doubt. And, and that, on Guardians 2, I didn't use the second unit director, you know, because I had such a terrible experience on Guardians 1 and just had to reshoot most everything that the second unit director did. So on this one, I, we do like what guy shot was very minimal, you know, was that, that scene. Um, but, uh, but it's, he's really important, but that's true about, I mean, Beth Mickle, our production designer and Juliana Makovsky, our, uh, our costume designer, those are, my, they're my, like, those are fully my creative partners, Henry Bram, the cinematographer. I've got those three people with me on set all the time. Unlike other like production designers and costume designers, they're with me a lot and their input is more important than anybody's input to me because they aesthetically understand the film and they always have things to say about, you know, stuff. And I also don't, I, I make it so that there's no clear divisions between production design and props and costume design and cinematography. It's all one thing. And so we're, we are really a team. And one of the great things about Suicide Squad was having this team of individuals together 
of me taking the best people that I'd worked with on Guardians 2, Guardians 1, on Guardians 3, which had shut down, and from, you know, even Super and, and before that, you know. My, I've been with my editor now, Fred Raskin, for a long time. So these people are all my partners, and you're absolutely right. They, uh, those people, you know, it, all the glory goes to the director, all the glory goes to the actors. But the production designer, the cinematographer, the casting designer, they created this movie as much as anybody. And it is a team effort, absolutely. Yeah, it brings me to that I wanted to say, uh, I always like giving a, like a shout out to an unsung hero. So besides the people you just mentioned, it, who's another person that you sort of just want to give a, a shout out to who just contributed a great deal to the movie? Well, I'm a big fan of my, my stunt folks. So Ingrid, who was uh, 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 Margot's, you know, stunt double, um, you know, Adam, who was, you know, David Desmount, Adam Hart was David Desmountian's stunt double, Spencer, who was Peacemakers, Nate, who was Idris's stunt double. Those guys are so great and they do a lot, you know. Um, Spencer, who's Peacemaker stunt double, has done the best stunts I've ever seen in my life on the Peacemaker TV show, by far. And he's beating the shit out of his body. So those guys, I love my stunt guys. They never get any, you know, attention. Actors are always taking credit for shit they do. And, uh, and I, I love those guys. I was gonna say, how hard is it to find a stunt double for John Cena? He's not a thin dude. Yeah, he and, he and Dave, we have Dave Bestie, so we have real problems with stunt doubling. But John's got his own guy, Spencer. And Spencer goes and he does every movie with John. And he's a total fucking filmmaker and a part of the process. And he's my friend and I, you know, he's a great guy. Something that I couldn't believe is that you built the jungle, you built the beach, all this stuff was built on a soundstage and it does not look like it's on a soundstage. Normally was, I noticed that. The beach wasn't on a soundstage, it was on a back lot. So it was outdoors. So the beach is way too big for any soundstage. It's like the size of four football fields. So it's enormous. And uh, I, I probably one of the biggest sets ever made. Um, and it, you know, it has working turbines that made waves happen. It has a beachfront. It has a forest of palm trees in Atlanta beyond the beachfront. And it was absolutely stunning. And when you were out there hanging out at night, it felt like you were on the beach. Definitely the greatest set I've ever been. What does Warner Brothers say to you or your producers say to you when you say, so I think we're going to have to build a beach. We're going to have to build this jungle. You know, is, you know, our, you know, uh, Nick Corda, our executive producer and my, you know, we're, we're figuring out really how can we do what we we want that looks the best and is the most cost effective. And that was really what it was. You know, we knew that we needed to make a size of we couldn't make a little patch of beach for that scene. It needed to be a big, huge beach. But actually going and shooting on the beach with rising and changing tides, with, you know, electricity nowhere to be found, with all of the things that could go wrong, that would have ended up being, you know, really problematic and more expensive. I mean, you can only shoot for so long every day if you want, you know, continuity to be the same with where the beach, where the tide is at. So it ended up being, that was just the most cost effective way to do it and also look the best. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Um, I'm just about out of time and I have a few other questions. So I'm just going to, I want to talk about the post-credit scenes. Was the final post-credit scene always what that was or did it possibly get added because of the TV show? It got added because of the TV show. I didn't, just, I didn't say I was going to do the TV show until after, um, until after the movie was basically finished, being cut. So then I got asked to do the TV show and then I said I would do it. And then when we started shooting the TV show, I shot the post credit scene. Was it always the other post credit scene uh, earlier in the credits or was, and did you have any other ideas for post credit no, scenes? That was always there. Was that originally gonna be at the very end of the credits? I think not. I think I was hoping I could put something else at the very end of the credits because I really like where that first post credit scene is now. I think it lays in nicely. I think it's, it's just a part of the story. You know what I mean? Like the post credits, the post credit scene, that's, it's not really, it's really its own thing setting up something else. But the first post credit scene is a part of the story in a way. It's sort of ironic that after all this time that that's what occurred. I love Ex Machina and uh, obviously because of Oscar dancing, because it's amazing. Um, you, you had David and John 
and I think someone else dancing in the movie. Did you give them directions on dancing? Not really. I don't think I did. I mean, I dealt a lot with the dancing uh, girls on stage. That was a <laughs> whole choreographed routine. Um, I don't know if you noticed who those dancers were, but. I didn't notice actually. <laughs> I can't believe no one has noticed yet. It's a pretty big deal. Um, but anyway, uh, the other guys, I, 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 you know, we talked about what it was like. I mean, you know, in, in the script, I think it said, John, you know, Peacemaker is white boy dancing, you know, and that's what John came up with, what that thing he was doing. And, you know, and then I think Daniela, I, I may have told a little bit about her doing that little twisty, twirly thing that she does. And then David Desmalchi is just his own thing. You don't have to, he fits so, like, he fits poke it out, man, like a glove. You don't need to tell him to do anything. <laughs> he, he is uh, so good in the movie. He is, yeah, yeah. He's I mean, listen, so Taylor made it for him, so I hope so. You know, he's been my friend for a long time. And I wrote and I called, I said, hey, I got a role for you. He's like, what is it? I'm like, poke it out, man. He's one of the leads of this movie. He's like, wow, okay. Have a great day. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Rusty. I'll talk to you soon, dude.